Okay, we're live. We're here Monday morning. We have uh, Mina and Marco and me. That's Mina Morita, the former chair of the PUC, now a consultant. Um, and Marco Mangelsdorf, the principal of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Uh, and me. I just hang around. Actually, today I, today I went, uh, as I did yesterday, to the um, Pacific Telecommunications Council Conference, which is a four-day conference at the Hilton Hawaiian Village. And I want to take a moment. If you look at me carefully, you'll see I have the lay they gave other journalists, and I have my membership badge. I may have both of them permaplaced. Uh, this was a fabulous, this is, it's going on, it's four days, this fabulous conference. I mean, it is an example of how well Hawaii can do when it focuses on being, you know, a center of excellence for the world. They come from everywhere. They are amazing. This is top of the line. There may be other telecom conferences, but this is the, the big daddy. This is the one where everyone wants to come. They do come. They network like crazy. I've never seen such an intense networking. They make deals while you watch. They immediately run and, you know, and make press releases about deals they cut, buying and selling and partnering. Um, these are the guys who are running telecom in the world. And they know each other. They're high level. They consolidate. They think policy. It is something to watch. Even if you don't care about telecom, it's something to watch because it's an example of, you know, good, solid tech collaboration. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. And I'd rather be with you guys because, you know, you're my buds. But if it wasn't you, I'd be at the PTC right now interviewing people. <laughs> we interviewed like 100 people, and they were all sweet. How do you like that? And the food was good. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that that's really great, Jay, because, you know, all of, you know, um, it's all about cooperation and competition in the same environment and, and uh, collaboration and integration. You yeah. know, that, that's, you know, that's, you know, kind of a recipe yeah. ingredient for success. Uh -huh. That is a salient point, I Mina. I think that we could learn from the way these guys work together. They're in there to make deals, not trouble. Uh, they're in there to help people all over the world. They're in there to advance the technology. Um, they are really, and a lot of women too, by the way. I don't want to say there are no women. There are lots of women involved. And they come from uh, every aspect. And the one underlying point is that they care a lot about raising, you know, the, raising the bar all over the world. Uh, I think uh, telecom is fabulous. And I think energy could learn, at least energy here could learn from from telecom. So, you know, mm -hmm. I have some luncheon tickets, you guys. You want to come around, you know, we'll <laughs> we can go to lunch together. <laughs> uh, anyway. I, it's hard for me to leave. It's really beautiful on Kauai today. <laughs> I figure. And the Big Island as well. <laughs> so uh, let me let me lead off by saying here on a show that I, I titled, if you want to change the title, Lena, you can. My, my title for our Mina Marita and me show today was a new time for oil only because oil and this is consistent with Marco's prediction by the way only because oil is now less than thirty dollars a gallon it's like the good old days before you know it will be in 1926 <laughs> what's going on well again thank you so much for having uh, me and having us Jay and I feel truly honored that you would choose uh, our company over this exciting group that you were with earlier so I <laughs> it almost leaves me speechless and it gives me some performance anxiety in terms of what in the world I could possibly say to to match with what you've been hearing but uh, I'll certainly give it my best shot and yes I mean I'm I've become rather addicted to following oil stories, oil uh, being reported on in the press, and uh, like you just mentioned, uh, last week it uh, went below, and as of a few hours ago when I last checked uh, the Wall Street Journal, it was trading at just uh, under $30 a barrel, and uh, J.P. Morgan Stanley is apparently predicting that uh, it could park at 25 through uh, most uh, of Q2. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it's truly, uh, to use a uh, Lewis uh, Carroll type language is getting curiouser and curiouser and uh, and causing not a small number of people in financial institutions and big countries like the Russians in Moscow, uh, the House of Saud in Saudi Arabia, uh, the folks in Venezuela and Nigeria that depend so much on a single export commodity to fund 
their their budgets and to fuel their economy. So I mean, it's you know I feel like we're going into terra incognita in 2016 in terms of of energy. It's just so uh, it, it really has my head spinning in terms of the ramifications on so many different levels when when you see oil that uh, is is trading as low as it is right now. It's just really striking. It leaves me speechless, Jay. Yeah, I agree. Mina, you have reaction to it? Yeah, I, I, you know, I just hope it doesn't derail all of our efforts and we lose sight because, you know, this is a volatile commodity that um, we have no control over. And, and so, you know, it comes down, it goes back up, and, and just, I, I just hope we don't lose sight. Because, you know, the, the other thing that we should be concerned about not only the pricing, but supply disruption, you know, that, that, um, and, and, you know, we're looking at, um, powder cakes all over, all over the world, especially in the Middle East. So, you know, even though we may expect, uh, uh, oil prices to drop even further with, um, Iranian oil coming onto the market. Um, you know, we, we just have to be cognizant and not lose sight that, you know, we're not only talking about pricing, but also um, supply disruption. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's a number of factors working. It's not, it's not just prices. Can't get locked in on that. And it's not just environment, although that, that alone is a good reason not to do oil. It's also uh, mm -hmm. Hawaii's vulnerability to the supply line. Uh, and, that, yeah. and that remains the same no matter what the price is, no matter what the uh, cost to the environment is. We have every reason to avoid using fossil fuel. Uh, we, have to, we have to do clean energy here. Our future is absolutely dependent on it. I, I agree with you, Mina. I hope, hope people don't forget that. Um, mm. But there's another aspect to it. Uh, and that is, as Marco alluded, you know, it, it's, it's frightening in the sense that it has a connection with glo global economy. And of course, the global economy is all interconnected now. And who's to say chicken and egg? And I'd be interested in whether it's a chicken, whether you guys think it's a chicken or the egg. But you know, either A, the global economy is slowing, ergo the cost of oil is down, price of oil is down, or the price of oil is down, and the, you know, what will follow is a slowdown, or both. It's chicken and egg, and I think we can expect, um, if this continues for any length, and it sure seems like it is, we can expect a general slowdown, and that will have ramifications for Hawaii, both as, a, you know, as the production end on the tourist market um, and also in, you know, in terms of the economy itself, in, in, you know, the global economy in general. Thoughts? Mm -hmm. I see one of the, the main linchpins these days, and this is getting, of course, a lot of press, is what's going on in China as far as their economy, what's going on in the incredible ups and downs, and more like down, down, down there. There are two main stock markets in Shenzhen and in Shanghai, which have uh, uh, lost a substantial amount of their value just in a, almost a handful of days. And I think so much, uh, so much of the world and the, and the financial community is looking to looking to the Chinese in terms of what are they doing about their economy and their slowdown, and uh, to what effect that has on on energy consumption, oil consumption, since they're one of the clearly one of the largest consumers of petroleum on the planet. So it's uh, it, it, it's hard to come up with an equation that you just throw in all these variables and hit the, the crunch button and say, oh, okay, yes, it all makes sense now. I mean, it's so so incredibly unpredictable, so incredibly unpredictable. And and I think uh, kind of drawing a few threads out to what's going on in Hawaii as far as renewable energy, because as the uh, price of oil comes down, the avoided cost price, i.e. wholesale price, comes down. Therefore, utility scale solar has to come down as well to be competitive with cheap oil. Maybe I'm missing something that Nina can uh, can uh, can contribute to here, but it seems to me that you know it's uh, that the lower the price of, of oil and substitute fuels, then that the, the harder the solar has to work to to uh, to compete. Yes, Mina, what right. do you think? Not yeah, I mean, I think that this. The, um, where you see a pretty good example where solar already has to compete is on Kauai. Um, you know, 
because they use that schedule Q. And, and, and so, you know, you, you're seeing somewhat of a, um, a more competitive market. And I think this is where um, the DER docket is going. Um, and, and, you know, how to get more, move solar more to, to a um, wholesale pricing rather than re reliant on um, retail net meter rates. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, you know, I think, you know, there's no choice here, um, but, but solar has to become competitive, um, not only with oil now, but other renewables too. Yes. Well, you know, it's kind of an interesting an interesting twist, which is if you've got a utility company that's entering into a long-term power purchase agreement for utility-scale solar megawatt hours at, at X, let's say X being 13, 14 cents a kilowatt hour with an escalator over X number of years, and oil drops to the point where the avoided cost actually goes down below the power purchase agreement price from a solar farm, then in essence, we're going in the exact opposite direction of where we wanted to go to. We're, we're paying a premium, a premium for solar power, rather than a solar power being a hedge against energy prices. Now, of course, what goes down will come up eventually, but in the meantime, avoided costs below the TPA prices for solar makes solar expensive by comparison. And, you know, who would have thought that? Well, you said before, Marco, that it was unpredictable, and I would offer this, that it's not only unpredictable in the direction it takes, these various variables and factors that are in play now, but it's also unpredictable in, in how long it goes in that direction and how drastic you know, the, the numbers are in that direction. So it's very hard to do business here. It's hard to do business by business, and it's hard to do business by government. You know, nobody can figure out where they're going. And uh, this is a real problem for, you know, uh, an initiative like clean energy in Hawaii. Um, and it takes, me to, uh, it takes me to your numbers uh, that you were sending around that you, you calculated or found on the installs of solar uh, over the past uh, year and now going into 2016. Uh, what does it look like for solar installs? Well, 2015 saw an increase in terms of PV permits on Oahu. Uh, PV permit increase in 2015 compared to 2014 of about 14 percent, one four, 14 percent, which is uh, certainly celebrated by everybody in my business. And after Hawaiian Electric announced about a year ago that they intended to seek the end of net energy metering, and the PUC finally went along in their decision and order in October, uh, I tracked numbers after October. Th 13th when net energy metering came to a close and the numbers in terms of under the new regime of customer grid supply and customer self-supply are a way way down uh, not surprisingly way way down uh, from the average of over 600 NEM PV permits a month they're now at somewhere in the 122 or so range uh, given just the past few months, so if you extrapolate that out, if that, if that were to continue, and this is the big if, if it were to continue at that pace of, you know, 150 or under 200, let's say, PV permits or PV sales compared to 600 plus from 2015, it now represents a, a huge hit, a huge hit on the PV industry. So uh, a lot of us still have uh, accumulated fat so to speak, about NEM systems that have been sold that are still being put in and will be put in for months. But unless you have that back channel or that uh, uh, that the sales can continuing to come in under the new regime, there's going to come a reckoning time, time of reckoning, when uh, there's going to be a lot less people employed, a lot of pure systems going in. Hmm. What does that what, mean? What does that mean for the initiative and for the industry and, and for the state and, and for Kauai? What does it mean? Well, I think Nina can speak to uh, kind of how things have been on Kauai. I mean, net energy metering has been gone since, when is it, mean, 2009, I think, and you, you haven't had their industry fold up and die. In fact, the recent numbers I got from KIUC saw that of, of the 3,000-plus 
TV systems that they've installed over the, the entire service territory, somewhere around a quarter of them went in in 2015 alone. So the idea that NEM was the death knell for PV on, on uh, the Garden Isle, at least, turned out to be a complete fiction. That's because the gar Garden Island is always different, no matter what. Right, Mina? Yeah. Yeah, we're a, separ we're a separate kingdom here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, were never, we were never conquered by Kamehameha. <laughs> oh. but, but I think, you know, we have to face, uh, you know, Marco has pointed out um, this out time and time again. You know, we're a finite system here. And, and so it's very difficult to, or it's possible to allow the exponential to continue. So um, this is solar. So um, yeah, I, I, we're we're up against a finite grid. Yep. All right, well, let's, to, to breathe on that, let's take one, uh, one minute off for a break. Uh, that's uh, Mina Morita uh, joining us from Kauai and uh, Marco Mangelsdorf joining us from the Big Island. Uh, we're talking about a new time for oil and everything else here on Mina, Marco, and me. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on Think Tech Hawaii. Center Stage airs every Wednesday at 2 o'clock, and of course you can check out our archives on YouTube or on Think Tech Hawaii anytime you like. Why should you do that? Because this is an arts show that I believe is making a difference in lives. We talk with uh, artists of various ilk. We talk with painters and, and writers, playwrights, novelists, poets, sculptors, dancers, um, you name it, directors, uh, uh, actors, of course. And we don't only talk about what people do, but we talk about how they do it. And my favorite part of the conversation, we talk about why they do it. And it's really common on this show to hear people say, wow, I didn't think about it that way. And it's very common to hear people afterwards who have seen the show say the same thing. And I hear all the time that people are inspired by the conversations that we have. So why don't you join us and be inspired too. That's Center Stage on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock. We'll see you Center Stage. We're back, we're live, we're here on a, oh my goodness, a Monday at noon with Mina, Marita, Marco, Mangelsdorf, and me. Um, and uh, as, we, as we left it, we were talking about the solar changes in the state uh, as against the oil changes in the world. But Mina, you had a question for Marco about numbers. What was that? Yeah, is there any way to extrapolate, um, you know, of the permit issues the kind of financing, um, you know, was it under a third party ownership or, or um, uh, cash or, or, or uh, owner finance model? I mean, can, can you tell? Or is it uh, only, uh, you know, only to, only to an extent and, uh, that, that is, you can tell when Solar City pulls a permit because they're acting as their own contractor. Uh, REC Solar, if I'm not mistaken, their residential side is essentially owned or run by Sunrun. But mm -hmm. everybody else that's not REC or not Vivint Solar or not Solar City, uh, you don't know. One doesn't know whether they are uh, making a direct sale or a customer financed sale or whether it's through uh, one of the uh, residential lease or, or PPA companies. So the, the answer to your question is that the, the, the data is not uh, good as far as being able to get any type of breakdown of systems that are going in and permitted in Hawaii, those that are being um, owned and getting tax credits for the homeowners versus uh, third, third party finance. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now we we would going to also discuss the Guernsey report. Uh, who wants to go first? Um. It was interesting. <laughs> There's a report that came out recently. Right. Just last the week. County, right. The county of Maui um, uh, went out with a request for a proposal to look at different forms of ownership models uh, for the county of Maui. And 
um, this report came out a couple of weeks ago, and I'm not sure when it was made public, but just recently. Um, so I thought it was interesting that um, it thought that the most ideal pathway to effectuate um, Maui County's desire for 100% renewable and sustainable energy as quickly as possible is looking at um, uh, more of the independent system upgrade model. And I just find that interesting because this is what the PUC has been saying since um, 2014. Uh, when it came out with its inclinations. Okay, um, those those but those models are all built, aren't they, on um, government models, right? Government operating the utility models. Well, there's, I think there's kind of two things here. One is ownership model, which is you know. Um, uh, in an investor-owned utility or a municipal, which is a public agency, or a um, cooperative, which uh, is a type of member-owned organization that uh, Marco is involved in. But I think if you look at the operational issue, no matter what kind of ownership model you're using, the operational challenges are the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Marco, does this uh, report help you or help the, the county of Hawaii um, on, you know, how to proceed? Is there anything in there that, that you take note of? Well, I, I have to admit to you that I have yet to dive deeply into the 260-page document. I have it. I'm, I'm actually in the Bay Area right now. I'm flying back tomorrow, and it'll be part of my, uh, my across the Pacific uh, reading material. But my, my hit so far is that my takeaways are that they, uh, the Guernsey, the Guernsey Consulting Group, which was paid X number of tens of thousands of dollars by the County of Maui and Mayor Alan Arakawa to look into options, is that they, they generally are not uh, favorable to the muni option, the municipal option, not least of which uh, reasons because Maui County is, is a multiple islands, multiple islands, and that makes that... Uh, that more uh, more challenging, and they seem to, uh, I think, are, are somewhat, if not pretty badly off course. If uh, if uh, I'm reading them correctly, where they're recommending the consideration of the so-called independent service uh, operator or ISO model, which is uh, in parts of the mainland, including California, as a possibility for Maui, uh, which uh, really doesn't make much sense at all to me, given the fact that. There's really not enough load to justify the, the cost of a, of a separate entity such as an ISO and that the, the admin cost could very well outweigh any benefits to the, to the rate payers. So that's, that's one of the, the, the reasons why I don't think it passes the SNP test. Second, if they were to go with an ISO model, uh, the existing power purchase agreements between Maui Electric and uh, First Wind, Sun Edison, uh, GE, and whomever else I'm leaving out, those would all have to get torn up, torn up and thrown out, because uh, uh, ISOs deal with that essentially, you mean it can correct me, dispatchable power at the cheapest rate to the consumer. Mm -hmm. So you, you tear up PPAs and you're, you're hitting people in the wallet. And then, uh, not least of which, the third one is, You'd have to have a docket opened on this subject, and it would be expensive, and it would be incredibly messy. So and time-consuming. You know, I'm sorry. And it would take a long time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it would take a long time. So, uh, I, from again having written in detail, yet I, I understand that the co-op model is one that they are more favorably inclined towards, which of course is music to my ears because I. I happen to, uh, you know, I have a vested interest in the co-op model as well. But I mean, it's an interesting, uh, interesting study, certainly. And it, to what degree it was it's political, and Arakawa is making a statement, or you know, more smoke than fire. 
versus how much of a real interest is there on the part of the county of Maui administration to really go in this direction. Mm -hmm. I mean, having the mayor talk about it is one thing. Having the chair of the council on Oahu talking about it is one thing for, for their island, but, I mean, it, it's, I think right now it's a lot more smoke than fire, and uh, it's more kind of politics and atmospherics. <clears throat> well, and, and that's a, you know, the thing is, they, they do mention the um, independent system operator model, and, and they touch on it as the fastest way to get there. But I think the point here is this is, some, this is a pathway already outlined by the PUC in their inclination that there's an evolution from the traditional um, utility model where ultimately you will get to an independent system operator model through this evolution. And that pathway is outlined in the PUC's inclination. And, and, and so um, it, it's like, I haven't heard of anybody that has um, disagreed with the PUC other than the Governor Ige on his LNG um, pronouncement, but as far as I know, that's the roadmap. Um, that's the regulator's roadmap to follow. And what Maui County is doing is um, trying to reinvent the wheel here. Mm. Um, and, and so. <laughs> So I think I, I see this report as more as validating the PCC's position. Um, and but but you know all this talk about new models for different islands strikes me that takes us further from two notions. One is the notion of um, you know an under uh, an underwater cable sharing power from one island to another, uh, and the other is the notion to uniform rates around the state. I mean, and there, there are some reasons, you know, to want that. Um, you know, one is to, you know, bring the state together uh, on energy, uh, as it should be, I think. Um, and, and, you know, and the other is it's a, oh, I don't know, it's a statement. Well, it's, it's a democratization is what it is. It's a statement and a, a realization of a democratization where nobody in the state pays more or less uh, for power and we all work on the same statewide grid. Seems to me that these notions of, um, you know, different models for different islands take us further away from that. Uh, thoughts? Um, well, I can't, I, can't, I can't help but think, when you said that, Jay, in terms of um, undersea cables, the example, again, we've talked about it before, of the super ferry, where you had, what was it, a maximum of two ferries. I don't remember if two were actually in service or one was in service and one was going to come into service. So it was the most, there were two. And this is something that had been discussed in the state for decades, why it makes so much sense to have a, a fast ferry from so many different perspectives. And, you know, we, we all know the history of that. And there, there ain't no super ferry now, and there ain't likely to be a super ferry anytime in the foreseeable future. And you look at undersea power cables amongst all the islands and it is an order multiple multiple orders of magnitude greater more difficult and a heck of a lot more expensive than a super ferry or two so i, I just you know I, I think of underwater cables as being kind of similar to fantasy land it, it, they'll probably eventually happen but i I'd, I'd really be surprised if it happens in our lifetime nina uh, I'm not sure how we got to undersea cables. Well, no, here, here it is. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, uh, you know, the different models um, on, on, on different islands seem to me to take us further away from a unified system or even a shared system like undersea cables where we share energy island to island. Um, what's your reaction to that? Is that true? Is there a cause and effect there? Uh, if we if we do different models on different islands, are we closer to? Are we further away from the notion of uniform rates and sharing? I, I just think that you know, if the focus is 
to um, break up, and this is my personal opinion, if the focus is to break up Hawaiian Electric, we 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 are detracting ourselves from um, the larger goals of you know affordability, reliability, and the greatest um, penetration of cost-effective renewables. Um, and it becomes more of a political question rather than, you know, what, what are the operational issues that we have to um, tackle um, to reach those three objectives of energy security, affordable cost, and, um, and renewable energy penetration. And I... You would favor you would favor the economies of scale of a larger utility. Well, I you know I I, I think you know right now the the PUC is on. Um, they've established a pathway. They you know a, a lot of thought research went into this in looking at how do you create this utility of the future that that's beneficial to the to consumers. And no one else has brought up a le less risky alternative. But Mina, and if I could ask a question, w w wouldn't establishing an ISO be de facto breaking up the utility companies? I mean, because their, their role their position would change rather dramatically under the ISO model, right? But that's but that's basically what you want. You you want some. It, it's no longer about generation anymore. It's more about balancing out the system and obtaining the the most cost effective resources available. And and so we're not going to go straight to an ISO model if it's evolution to an ISO model. Mm. And that's what the PUC inclination lays out, that evolution. Yeah, it's all about evolution. Right now, we're going to evolve into a break, if you don't mind. That's uh, <laughs> Mina Morita, Marco Mangelsdorf, here on Mina Morita. I mean, Mino, Marco, and me. We'll be right back. <laughs> Hi. I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Come join us every Friday at 2 p.m. when I interview interesting scientists about what they do, why they do it, and why we should all care about it. It's a lot of fun to see. We hear, and you can learn interesting stuff. You'll hear all kinds of fascinating science, and we know you'll have a great time. Hope to see you then. Bye-bye. Aloha, my name is Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and I'm the host of Sustainable Hawaii, at thinktechhawaii.com. We air live on the internet and also on Oceanic Channel 16. I would invite you to come for a fresh new show every Tuesday from 12 to 1 o'clock. I try to bring on guests that give us a different viewpoint on aspects of sustainability in Hawaii, as well as trying to unpack some of the difficult concepts of measuring and achieving sustainability, particularly with regard to sustainable economic growth and prosperity in Hawaii. Please join us every Tuesday from 12 to 1 p.m. Mahalo, aloha. Okay, we're back, we're live, we're here with Mina Morita and Marco Mangelsdorf uh, in our uh, bi-weekly Mina, Marco, and me program, which I enjoy very much. And today we started with oil, but we've covered much, much more. So let's go to the, you know, the 800 pound gorilla, or shall I say the 8, eight million pound gorilla uh, next era. What, what's the tone and tenor of that now? Where are we? Um, what, what's the procedural status? Um, what has to happen? What does it look like? And what's the chatter? You know, you want to take a first crack at that? No, <laughs> go ahead. I, 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 have, I I've been on vacation. <laughs> Okay. It's coming back online on February 1st. Gee, that's only uh, two weeks from, well, 
uh, two weeks from now, yeah. So it's, now it's just going to go into the, the last inning, I think. Well, I'll, I'll happy, be happy to take a crack at it. Uh, we're uh, we're at halftime right now, Jay. Uh, we've been at halftime since the 16th uh, of December when the first round of hearings were uh, brought to a close by Chairman Randy Awase. And we were told by Randy on that day that the hearings would likely restart uh, two weeks from today on February 1st. Uh, as of Friday, we had all the interveners uh, have had heard nothing officially from the commission in terms of a procedural schedule, which I find uh, rather surprising given that there will be people coming from, uh, a number of people coming from the mainland who uh, still haven't been given a, a firm game plan in terms of when their number might be called, so to speak, in terms of being uh, cross-examined. So that's up in the air. Uh, the uh, next year has been rather quiet uh, since the 16th of December, from what I can tell. Uh, to what extent they're, uh, you know, they're in their locker room and they're talking adjustments that they need to make for the second half and changing schemes and substituting players and so forth. Uh, I'm not privy to, but. My sense, my sense is that they had, they, they reached their peak mojo, their their peak momentum, the big mo, the little mo, the medium mo, uh, between the the hearing, the public listening session that uh, was conducted on Oahu that saw, saw a very good turnout for next year, and then they were able to bag several of the interveners, and they were able to bag. Department of Defense, although I think that's kind of getting them into some hot hot water these past weeks, mm -hmm. and they were able to bag uh, you know more unions, but I think uh, they're they're mo they're mo stopped as of mid December, and I think uh, objectively, regardless of how I would like the the docket to play out uh, one way or the other, uh, I, I'd say it's difficult to make an objective case that over the past month or so that they've had a very good month that you can. I can't find any indicators whatsoever uh, on the streets, uh, behind the, the, the doors, or in the press that indicates that, uh, that uh, they've got their momentum back or that their mojo is back. Uh, I think you can make a strong case that it's, it's just the opposite. Well, assume, so, assume that for a minute, Marco. Uh, if you were them, what would you do now to, to brighten, you know, brighten the possibility? Well... I think they're really they're really hamstrung, Jay, because uh, uh, Chairman Iwase said in his dissent a couple weeks ago, he said uh, essentially, don't you dare think about doing any uh, uh, third party deals or cutting any de uh, you know doing any more horse trading. This ain't this ain't a political uh, negotiation here. So I I, I believe that. Uh, Next year, essentially shut down their efforts to try to peel off more interveners. And so is it possible at this point for them to sweeten the pot to address the concerns that the chair of the PUC brought up on the 16th of December and other concerns? Uh, I, I say they're kind of hamstrung now. It's kind of, you know, you provided your best and last final offer, and we're not going to tolerate any more additions to the offer. I mean, that's the message that I got from Owasco. Well, it's another NBA. part of that, as you mentioned, is that <clears throat> is that they had a, a they were on a bit of a roll by, by getting people to um, come and side side with them um, and attempt to drop out as interveners, and that that sounded pretty good at the beginning. At least, as somebody out there likes Nextera, what I was not aware of, and you guys maybe figured it out before, uh, was that each time they got somebody to you know, back them up, uh, whether it be the union or the DOD, um, they made a deal. Uh, it wasn't just that that organization came forward and said, yes, we think this is a good idea, we want this to happen. This is in the public interest. It wasn't that simple. There was always a quid pro quo. And that was the revelation. And uh, I think he cut that possibility off now, uh, which is, it, it limits their toolkit. It limits their, their, their bag right now not to be able to do that. Nina? Well, I think, you know, I think there are procedural issues that one should be aware of moving forward and how difficult it is to maneuver. But the statute um, allows for negotiated settlements. 
you know, so, you know, it's how do you, how do you find the balance? You know, if you have a condition that needs to be massaged and can be made better, why shouldn't it be done? You know, I can understand... Well, I think... I, well, I can understand bringing something out of the blue to the table, something new. But if you have on, if you have something on the table that can be massaged and made better, what's the problem with that? The, and yeah, statue I, I, allows oh. and statue allows for negotiated settlement. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree, and that was another uh, assumption that I made is that if they wanted to cut a deal, they could cut a deal. They could negotiate their way, you know, they could, to have this intervener drop out. Um, but apparently he doesn't well, feel he, that way, and this is this is not bode well for next era. Marco? Here's, here's the important, really, and I think Mina mentioned this in a previous conversation we had, the really important distinction to make, cutting a side deal with an intervener uh, that is not part of the publicly stated commitments that is part of Exhibit 37 in terms of the, the 85, 86, 89, however many we're up to, that are part of the evidentiary record, you can, you can cut side deals until the fresh mangoes fall off the trees. But when you start going down the path, as they did with Department of Defense, and adding to the commitments that were already put out there by next year, that's what's reopened the whole process, albeit for a short time, to, uh, to discovery, which is what we're doing right now. We just last week, a number of interveners posed IRs, information requests, and the respondents have until Friday, uh, Thursday, excuse me, Thursday to respond. So that's where they blew it, essentially, where they came out and said, we're adding, the, we're adding commitments to what we already said, and that blew open the door for more evidentiary time uh, and where, we're, where we are right now. This is so interesting, you guys, and we can't but, be finished but, with it. There's more. Mina, why don't you make a last statement on the subject, then we got to move to close. So, but, you know, okay, two things here is that the, the, the PNC fixed the procedure. So, you know, it's time to move on. Um, the new exhibit is in. Everybody's commenting on it. And, um, you know, the, the, the procedures for this has been updated, so... You know, I think it's kind of time to move on. You had mentioned, you know, what's next for next year? What do they have to do? Um, have to show their expertise in the power systems improvement plan. I, I, I yeah. think they need to demonstrate their analytical abilities there and what they're willing to commit to because that PSIP will give us a glimpse into um, – Nextera's um, commitment to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Well, we're certainly not finished with this process. There's much to come. Maybe, maybe well, some real fireworks too. Yeah, but what? what you, I just like that. Go ahead. That one thing. One thing to what Mina said, which is that the flip side to the PSIP is that now we know because Nextera said so that they are working with Hawaiian Electric on the next rev, the next edition of the PSIP, and yet all during the hearings and in the responses to information requests, their line has been, we don't know what we're going to do until we take over. So now they are getting very much involved when all these past months they're saying we're not involved. So that they really, you know, they can't have it both ways. They can't say we're not involved, we're not really doing much until we, we take helm of the ship, and now it turns out that they are walking into the captain's galley and, and co-piloting to some extent. <laughs> Because that's what because that's what everybody is. <laughs> I'm I'm laughing because this is this is the most exciting thing that that has happened in energy years, <laughs> and, and there's so many wrinkles and issues. I I love to have these conversations with you guys. Well, let's take one more minute, Mina, and can you talk about the uh, Hawaii uh, Energy Policy Forum legislative briefing that is scheduled for this Friday, this Friday, January twenty second. Yeah, this Friday, 1.30 to 4 o'clock in the auditorium. Um, you know, we have um, Rick Roslow from Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, Mark Glick, 
and um, <laughs> Chris Yunker talking about the challenges of um, achieving 100% RPS and, and the modeling work that's been going on. Um, so we have that section. We have Dr. Chip Fletcher, um, Ben Sullivan, uh, talking about change, the impact of Hawaii and um, to Hawaii to participate in um, uh, the outcomes of COP um, 2015. Finish um, up now, Mina, because we're almost out of time. Okay. Um, DOT coming in with their clean energy um, achievements and, and uh, roadmap to, for clean energy and ground transportation. And the panel I'm involved in talking about integration, innovation, and partnership. Okay, go to hawaiienergypolicy.org, find out more, uh, and just come down. You don't have to sign up, just come down. It's in the uh, uh, auditorium of the legislature, and we want to have a crowd, so come on down. The most important discussion of our time here in Hawaii. Nei. Thank you, Mina. Thank you, Marco. Two weeks from now, it's all set. Mina, Marco, and me. Aloha, you guys. You guys rock. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>